Welcome to the second Sense.Nano Symposium. Uh, my name is Brian Anthony. Um, my main job today is to try to keep everybody on time, so we're doing really well. We're only five minutes late already. Um, the, the theme for this year, uh, for the symposium, uh, is sensing our most precious resources, gaining insight into the water, environment, and agriculture systems that are all around us. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration, and we'll, we'll, we'll pull those slides up in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to bring to the Sense.Nano into, into context. Last year, we launched Sense.Nano as the first center of excellence powered by MIT Nano uh, in recognizing sort of a convergence of, of a number of different exciting things. Certainly, MIT Nano, which you'll hear a lot about in a little bit. Um, advanced manufacturing, the, the, the massive thrust that the United States and worldwide is putting into looking at novel ways of, of creating physical products. Uh, and then the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there are at least seven of these new innovation manufacturing institutes, uh, three of which have significant footprints in manufacturing of sensors. So with, uh, in, in sensors that build on integrated photonics, in sensors that build on flexible electronics, uh, in sensors that that uh, build in fabric and material. And then certainly you, you can't look in the, the press and the, uh, the popular and scientific media without hearing about IoT, the cloud, uh, which is somebody else's computer, but it's uh, the cloud, uh, and, and big data. Um, and it's not gonna be too far into the future when this massive infrastructure that we're putting in place for acquiring and managing and storing data is going to be starved for novel and innovative sensors, and Sense.Nano can play a very significant role there. When we talk about sense or sensors, sensing systems, we're not just talking about IoT. We're not just talking about individual small little sensors that are on a person, on a machine, on bridges for condition monitoring. It's that, but it's a lot more. So certainly sensors, things that would help you improve interaction between man and machine. Um, so a, a color sensor that changes, a sensor that changes color based on how hard you're interacting with it. A, a, an atomic small little sensor. But included in the scope of things that we consider for Sense.Nano are, are sensing systems. So work by Kamal Yusuf Tumi in creating a, a very fast atomic forest microscope that allows us to visualize chemical processes as they are happening. And then another great example is work by Sengit Dabatia in sensing techniques, where I use this as a sort of a notion of, well, we may be producing particles, nano, engineered nano particles that in themselves aren't sensors. We deploy them into an environment, whether it be a person, an, uh, an oil field, the atmosphere, or water, and then we retrieve them. And how they've changed and how they've interacted with the environment tells us something about what they've sensed, about what they've experienced. So a sensing approach. So sensors, sensing systems, and sensing techniques. Last year, when we launched Sense.Nano, it was very broad, uh, looking at what are the, the exciting areas that we should be doing work in. And we had a lot of uh, both feedback from the participants in, in this meeting, and then a a series of meetings with uh, our, some leadership from a number of different companies that gave us some recommendations on the interesting things that we should pursue. And we'll, we'll hear from a number of those companies today, and we'll, we'll actually hear at the end of the day from some of the projects that were funded based on a call for proposals that went out last year. This year, um, in focusing on agriculture, and focusing on water, and focusing on an environment, we're able to collaborate with entities on campus that are already playing in those areas, that we're, we're trying to amplify phenomenal work that's already happening. So we're collaborating in Sense.Nano this year in the symposium with ESI, the Environmental Solutions Initiative, and JWAPS, the Abdul Water, uh, World Water and Food Security Lab, and MIT Nano. These are the event sponsors. Now, before I introduce our next speaker, so you have the agenda in front of you. It's a very busy day. Uh, we won't be spending excessive amount of time um, introducing the speakers, all of the speakers' biographies, so the little bios are in, are in the booklets. Um, so our, our first session after the keynote will be on an environment. The second session will be on water, food, and agriculture. Then we'll hear from a number of startup companies in session three. We'll take a little bit of a break there. Um, we'll have session four on chemistry, instrumentation, and agriculture. We'll have a panel discussion uh, led by Heather Goldstone uh, from NPR Radio. Um, and then the concluding session, session six, sensing applications and advancements. And we'll hear a little bit more about 
some of the, the projects that were initiated last year. Um, so it's a busy day, um, so I, I thank you for your, your time and attention. I'll try to do my best to keep everybody on schedule. Um, but with that, I want to introduce uh, Vladimir Bulovich, who is the founding director uh, of MIT Nano. And he'll give a little bit of overview of MIT, MIT Nano and then introduce us to our keynote speaker for the day. And uh, again, I'll try to keep us on time. And thank you for your time and attention today. And, and Vladimir, please. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. And indeed, um, uh, we are, MIT Nano is one of the three sponsors of the event uh, you see today. You might notice a connection between Sense.nano and MIT.nano. Indeed, uh, uh, MI Sense.nano is the first center of excellence that we uh, are, have launched last year in order to support uh, those examples of different centers of excellence across the campus. Sense.nano is an independent entity of MIT Nano, but it is powered indeed by the activities of MIT Nano and the entire campus as we see it. What I wanted to show you is uh, what is going to happen in the next couple of days. Uh, uh, that is to say, as uh, we have embarked upon the, the process of building MIT Nano, uh, well, that was about six and a half years ago for me, over a decade for some other people across the campus, and indeed for about four years as much as most of the campus experience construction. Uh, the building, as you have renditioned in here, indeed will uh, come to uh, opening. Uh, this uh, coming Tuesday, pardon me, Wednesday. What we will do is uh, tomorrow afternoon, we'll have a soft community meeting, uh, so what we call soft opening, to allow us to indeed take the first look, the glimpse into MIT Nano as a structure. It's located right in the heart of campus, and as a result, it will enable all of us across all the disciplines to advance topics of sensing and variety of other uh, expect, uh, uh, indeed explorations that campus supports. Uh, beyond that, uh, inside the space itself, uh, you will find a uh, variety of spaces, clean spaces to be able to manage nanoscale objects as needed and build from them macroscale technologies. Down in a basement for metrology and imaging, you'll be able to explore the way matter is put together or structures you made, uh, have they come out the right way. <laughs> and then up on the top, the prototyping facility and chemistry teaching labs, one for teaching the, our next generation of innovators and prototyping facility in order to be able to launch those sets of ideas developed in other places of MIT Nano and the rest of the campus into handheld objects that can, that can indeed provide transformational change. We have imagined a space like MIT Nano a few years back. This is uh, how we have drawn it up. And as of a couple of weeks ago, that's how it looked. Um, the, uh, Building is indeed complete. Uh, there are a variety of touch-ups that we still need to do, hence it will not be completely open for the next couple of months. But you will have a chance to see the first look into it tomorrow afternoon if you join us for the community, community event starting at 3 p.m. at 26100, right nearby MIT Nano. And then from that event, we'll step into the courtyards. MIT Nano is indeed an entity that is there to support the entire campus but also it is enabled by the partnerships and with our founding members and the evolving sets of additional member companies that are supporting our operation. So I'll take this moment to thank uh, our founding members, Analog Devices, Dutch State Mines, DSM, IBM. Uh, these are the first three of what we expect to be a number of companies that will very deeply engage in the operation of MIT Nano and give us guidance in these early days on how to advance it further. Indeed, with that being said, uh, it is my true honor uh, to invite on the stage Marcus Remmers, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Royal DSM. Um, Marcus is uh, very experienced uh, in a variety of things and has a strong knowledge in polymer and life sciences, R&D, business operations, business development strategy, and management. And we have asked him this morning if he would give us a keynote, giving us perspective on variety of technologies, indeed DSM, indeed at this point is supporting. Please, Marcus, join us. Thank you, Vladimir. Good morning. It is truly a pleasure to be here today for this exciting moment when uh, MIT Nano for the first time allows the world to sneak peek 
into these new facilities that will <coughs> invent the future. In fact, the best way to predict the future is to create it. That's a quote that I probably steal from, I'm sure you know, Abraham Lincoln, that it was as true at the time as it is today. And I would argue even today, nanotechnology already has an impact on energy and agriculture that we see in many ways. And in fact, we will see how this technology, how the ability to control the smallest elements at molecular level have big impacts in these areas. Now, as I started to think back and say, hey, I'm going to Boston, what am I gonna say about energy and agriculture? My daughter came by, 15-year-old Daniela, and she looked over my shoulder and said, hey, Dad, what are you doing? And I said, I explained, you know, MIT, talk, and she said, oh, come on. How difficult can it be? It's only science. <laughs> Imagine it would be poetry. So you know, there's at least one nerd living at home with us, and uh, of course, I think a little bit what Danny misses is, I feel like coming to MIT and giving a talk about science, it's a little bit like coming into the dressing rooms of the New England Patriots before the Super Bowl and giving them a talk about offensive tactics. <laughs> so during my academic time, I actually will say I made it to Stanford, but I never made it to, uh, to Boston, which I think is really another league, and I'm not talking about the Ivy League, I am talking about the MIT, which for me truly is a league in itself. And I'm very, very happy to be here as founding member in this journey to open MIT Nano together. In fact, I'd say if you want to get inspired by the future, all you have to do is really walk around this campus. It's graduation week, and we were talking about it yesterday. If you want to see the future of science, walk around, look in the faces of the young graduates, look at the energy, and it's impossible not to get infected by the enthusiasm, by all the ideas and all the stuff that's going on at MIT. My wonderful wife would say, es como pollo en primavera no sabe donde poner los huevos. It's like a chicken in spring. It's so exciting, you really don't know where to lay your egg. So with all of this, um, Vladimir could tell you much more about nanotechnology than I will ever know, but there is one thing that I do know. Society today needs it much more urgently than we've ever needed it. Because if you look at the way we live, at, we look at the way we've been using the resources of this planet for the last 40 years, you will find it is simply not sustainable. In 2050, we'll be about 10 billion people on this planet, and if you look at the speed at which we use fossil fuels, at which we use rainforest, and use, in which we use pretty much any resource, the United Nations Bureau of Sustainability predicts we're gonna need more than three planets Earth to sustain 10 billion people of this planet. That's a bit of an issue because we only have one. So we really have to think about sustainability as one of the challenges of our time. In fact, the United Nations have defined, I'm sure you've seen those, the 17 sustainability goals. And as DSM, we're really committed to make this the heart of our strategy. It's a very diverse set of goals if you look at it from poverty to, um, to nutrition. At DSM, we feel particularly passionate about three goals. That is fighting climate change. That is circularity, resource scarcity. And that is healthy nutrition. And these aspects really are something where we can wonder what impact will nanotechnology have. And I think the missing link between these two is, so let's, before we get there, let's um, have a look at um, an example where, where that really drives it home. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on Earth, the only one that's visible from space. And I don't know if any of you is scuba diver, I'm, I'm, I love scuba diving, and uh, it's such a, 
profound experience when you're down there and you have the sense that you're a visitor in a world that's not yours, that exposes you to a million miracles. And for that, for me, it's particularly emotional to see that great parts of the Great Barrier, which great, great Barrier Reef, which is in fact one of the great test diving grounds on the planet as well, have already died. And why is that? It's mainly two influences back to agriculture and energy. It is because through the warming of the waters and the acidification of the waters um, that provides an issue for the corals to grow, but there's also through the um, washing off of fertilizers and pesticides from the mainland into the Great Barrier Reef, a severe threat to the survival of this great structure. In fact, the Australian government has put together half a billion Aussie dollars. I believe that's about 400 million in real money to save the Great Barrier Reef. And that's mainly really to support agriculture to be more precise, and that's the word here, to be more precise in the way how we intervene, how we provide agriculture. So for me, sustainability is again the great challenge of our society and how can to translate this to science, it's precision. That really is the word. The precision economy is a word that you hear a lot. People talk about individualized <coughs> medicine. What it really is, is understanding at molecular level what's happening so that we can be more precise in our intervention. So with nanotechnology, with our ability to sense at molecular level exactly what's happening, at what stage, at what time, it allows us to intervene much more precise and thus avoid the waste. Imagine how many molecules of fertilizer never see a plant. You put them on the ground, you spray and pray, and then afterwards you find the majority of these molecules doing things that really you didn't imagine they would be doing. So let's come back a little bit to nanotechnology. I don't need to tell you too much about the scales here. We're talking about something that's very, very small. If we look at an ant, that's five millimeters, five million nanometers. We go to the next level, microbes at micro level, bacterium, micrometer level, and then DNA at uh, two nanometers. So this is the scale at which we play. And if through MIT Nano we can uh, put this new, uh, understand how these building blocks work together, I would say we upgrade the currency of chemistry, that's the molecule, to a new level. If we are able to manage it, assemble it, and put this together in ways that previously we couldn't do. In fact, we see this a theme in science today, if you just look at the Nobel Prize last year, I have to say this working for a Dutch company, of course. It went to Ben Ferencha, a Dutch chemist from the University of Groningen, for his work and other groups on molecular machines. It's absolutely fascinating if you look at the movie where he has the molecular car, it's powered by, by solar, by light, driving on, the, on a silica wafer. So we have molecular machines there that go on rails. We have molecular motors that turn around axis. And our ability to see these things at that level, to assemble them at that level, to sense will be allowing things for intervention that today we can't dream of. And we need, coming back to our challenges for sustainability. So let's talk a little bit more about energy before we come to agriculture. I can't help but thinking that our children, my daughters, your children, or their children will look back at one point and say, what were these people thinking, digging through the ground, trying to extract fossil fuels, while the strongest source of energy was shining in our face. 100 million um, miles away, but still the sun in one hour delivers more energy to the earth 
than we can generate in a year. Now, it's not quite as simple translating the solar energy into LNG that we can use, but it is one of the ways where nanotechnology can help to harvest the solar energy better and in a more effective ways. And that's actually an area where at DSM we're particularly passionate about. We call it, the, uh, our, our solar business, same sun, more power. I think it's a, a, a brilliant, I uh, don't want to praise ourselves too loud here, but that's a really a brilliant phase. What we do is we put coatings on top of solar elements um, to reduce the reflection and get, capture more light in the solar cell to increase the output by three to four percent. Now, how do we do this and what does this have to do with nanotechnology? If we start, very simply look at a photovoltaic element uh, um, with a metal frame that holds a glass plate in place, which is the one that we have the coating on, we'll come back to that. That is essentially uh, put with an intermittent layer that's essentially a glue um, connecting the actually silicon wafers with the glass, there's another glue, and then the back sheet that gives this entire thing its mechanical stability. Pretty simple and straightforward. Let's just remember the intermittent uh, barrier between the glass and the solar cells because we'll come back to that. But if you look at the glass on top where the, the, um, the photons enter, this is where we can intervene. And this is where it gets a little technical now from a nanotechnology perspective. So what we've developed here is basically a method where we start with um, silicon precursors that in a very careful way we hydrolyze to build nanoparticles of silicon. And in that solution they have a tendency to aggregate with themselves. But we do this in the presence of a latrix masis, which is negative charges on the top. And since the silica particles are positively charged, they have a tendency to self-assemble to these core shell particles. That in itself is the magic. If you can really understand how to control these latex particles, how to uh, control this self-assembly process, you've got a building block with this core shell particle that, can, that you can use to start and play with. And we do that in terms, of, first of all, let's look at how we can really see that, and that's where new technologies come in place where we'll see at MIT Nano much more of those. And it's incredible. If you look at the capabilities that these analytical tools have today, look on the left-hand side, the, uh, the cryotem new method that was just invented a couple of years ago. This is state-of-the-art pictures, and you see the core shell particle, the polymer in the middle, the silica around it, and the solvent matrix in between. So you can see their shape, we can see their size, we can literally con deduct you know, these, uh, we can look at the particle size distribution. We can actually look at the um, SEM, or actually TEM, where um, we can see these particles lined up on a wafer. Again, beautiful, the size and the, the morphology clearly visible. And if you look at the atomic resolution, if you look at the cross section of the sphere, you see silica on the outside, carbon on the inside. So it is, in fact, what we want it to be. We've got the latrix polymer in the center and the silica on the outside. Now, if we put this in our solution with a bunch of um, fillers and, uh, and other additives, we can basically make a film out of this that we put on the glass through conventional roller coating technology or any other technology that you, that you can imagine, and this way create a thin film on the glass. Now the next step, all you need to do is to cure this by really uh, make it very hot, and this way you freeze the silica structure, and you end up with a sponge-like structure because the carbon basically depolymerizes and leaves, and you end up with a hole full of whole like structure of silicon. And if you know what you're doing, and you can control these particles well, you can control the thickness, of course, you can control the size of the holes, the dimensions, the distribution, the anisotropy, whatever you want to, 
And with this, you can tell you the optical properties. And of course, that's where this is important because with that, you can tailor the film such that you minimize, that you capture basically the photons inside the film through destructive interference. If you get to the right angle, you see a glass wafer without the coating has transmittance of about 91 or so percent. And if you put on the layer on one and on the other side, you get an increase of transmittance by 3% or so per layer. So a very clear way of how understanding at nano level translates through the various steps of something that makes a real difference. Because if you add this up, the 3% of all the solar elements in the world, the amount of additional energy and electrical energy that you can harvest from that is, of course, really, really exciting. Let's move on to another element in, um, in solar energy, and that's um, thin films. And that's, of course, the work that uh, Vladimir is working on with one of our visiting scientists, Damien. I don't know, are you here today, Damien? Oh, there you are. Um, thin films where um, we look at ways of making flexible or even transparent devices. Now imagine the, the street lamp on your street that has the film on top, gathers the energy during the day and during the night. Of course, these devices are already there, but if you think a little further, the opportunities that this gives us are, are humongous. And it's not only the perovskites. Um, this chart to me is, is the most exciting letter that I, that I wish I could see. They have a new edition of it every month. You see there the world records of um, cell efficiency based on the different technologies. Bunch of interesting lessons there. First of all, Vladimir holds a couple of the world records that we see there, so that's probably a pleasure for you to see. But apart from that, this is not a one-trick pony. There is many, many horses in the race and nanotechnology plays a role in pretty much each of those. So the more we understand in each of those devices, the morphologies, the way we assemble the different layers, the way we connect those gives um, a huge rise to the right side. The other lesson, interesting enough, if you look at this, in the 90s, there was very little public research money available for solar energy. And you saw things leveling off there pretty much. Whereas in recent years, huge investments, rightly so, in solar energy, and you see how that pays off. And I'm sure if we sit here in five years and we look at this, we can see how this goes. And MIT Nano again, and that's the challenge for us, will have its fair share there to allow us to control these things better, and the better the underlying technologies get, the more we'll see an acceleration of these technologies to come together. With that, just imagine you have transparent photovoltaic elements. The world becomes a gigantic solar park. You can put it in streets that provide their own lightning. You can put it on walls. You can put it in uh, roofs. You can even put it in windows and have your electricity um, gained in all places. Now, why is this also relevant from a sustainability perspective? Before we get there, another element here of um, things how nanotechnology in this space can get us inspired. If we go back to nature and learn from that, nature has been converting sunlight into chemical energy for a little while, so maybe there's something that we can learn. And in fact, in the collaboration of um, DSM, who is a leader in the manufacturing of carotenoids, and uh, Vladimir's group, who understand a thing or two about quantum dots, there is a very interesting way to put these two things together. Now, why are carotenoids important for solar energy? Because they absorb light in a part of the spectrum where the, solar, where the um, silicon is not absorbing very efficiently. In fact, we've seen silica being stuck at 25 or so percent efficiency, so the majority, 80% of the light doesn't get there. So if we could use, and I mentioned this initially, the layer between the glass and the silicon and put in nanoparticles there that absorb light in the higher energy spectrum where the silica does not absorb and down convert it into photons at the wavelengths which are relevant for the silicon cell, suddenly we've got another way how we can boost the efficiency of the solar cell. 
another way of creative combining different elements of that nature offers to, to get us where we need to be. And of course, carotenoids in the, future, in the nature have that same similar function as well. So back to the, um, to the sustainability goals. This is not an academic discussion here because you can imagine, okay, we reduce the cost of um, solar cells below the cost of fossil fuels, and I'd say we're almost there. But imagine 1.3 billion people on this planet don't have electricity. There's many countries that don't have a primary electric infrastructure like we have. There's not a given that you just sit there in the evening, switch on the light, and read a book. And lightning, or the ability to have light in the evening, correlates with education, and education correlates with leading out of poverty. So enabling solar cells in decentralized ways to have electricity there for people to be able to read, to have medical intervention, or to charge their cell phone, which gives another way of um, uh, a wireless infrastructure, is something that has a big contribution overall to, um, to have a very direct impact on people's lives. With that, let me move to agriculture. Now, I'd argue 10 years ago, we'd say agriculture, that was this boring thing where people get on their tractor <coughs> in spring, they put some seeds in the ground, and then half a year later, they come, take out, chop it off, and there's your food, and then we'll do this next year again and again and again. I'd argue these days are over particularly if I have in mind the four planets that we need to have to, to feed the world. Today, I would say we need to look at agriculture in a different way. For every square foot that we have, we should think carefully if we convert the sunlight into photovoltaic elements and electricity, or we use photosynthesis to convert into chemical energy, and then we have three ways that we can go about it. We can either take the chemical energy in the plant and eat it and power ourselves. Okay, we know that. But we can also take the chemical energy that we produce and turn it into biofuels and power our cars. Or we take the chemical energy and transfer, transfer this into bio-based monomers, which then are used for materials that we use in our day-to-day environment. So you see it's an entirely different approach to agriculture that we need to have in mind for this overall sustainability. And again, we need to feed 10 billion people and we can only do this really if on the one hand we increase the production and at the other side we do this in ways that um, minimize the runoff. So precision again is the the, the core word here, and what does it mean again for, for nanotechnology? Everybody is talking about the microbiome for humans. There's 10 times more bugs in the human than there are cells, we know all that. But do we understand also that there's over 30,000 different microbes around the roots of a plant? What if nanotechnology allows us to understand that interaction? What if we could intervene in much smarter ways to further the, the bugs that have antimicrobial or antifungal uh, properties, or how we can manage the flow of minerals or of water in more effective ways? In fact, we can expect already that 30% of all pesticides that we use today in the foreseeable future will be replaced with more bio-based interventions, either bio-based um, pesticides or innovative ways to be much more precise um, in our intervention there. Another angle to look at canola. We all know this, we know these beautiful plants. Um, now is actually the time where they flourish. You see these, these yellow flowers. And what we do with it, of course, um, we cut this and we press it to get the rapeseed oil out of it. That's an important nutrient, so it's all great. But we leave about 50% of 
depressed biomass and essentially throw it away. So we don't throw it away, we give it to animals to feed on it, but basically we consider it's waste. Despite the fact that there's a lot of very valuable nutrients in those canola plants. So we looked at this at DSM and tried to figure a way how can we be stronger in our way to use these resources more wisely. And in fact came up with a way to extract the proteins out of this canola. And these proteins are very high quality. You can use them for energy bars. You can use them for weight management products, for sports drinks. Of course, they're vegan. They are gluten-free. Um, and above all, their bio, uh, bio, the, the biomass or their eco balance is, is very positive because plant proteins are so much more sustainable than any animal protein can ever get. If you would do that, if you do the math, theoretically, there's more than 500 million people that could be fed with this protein that we can extract from that waste. Now, that's the easy part. The tricky part is, again, canola is notoriously difficult to grow. And we need to spray these plants about 20 times before we harvest those. 20 times, imagine. If you would have gotten into a John Deere tractor five years ago, 10 years ago, it would have been the good old John Deere thing, would you imagine? If you get into a John Deere tractor today, I promise you, you feel like Captain Kirk on the bridge of, Starf of Starship Enterprise because there's, it's all GPS driven and there's all sorts of tricks. Precision agriculture is already there with satellite driven pictures and everything. But still, I would argue the majority of the fertilizer and the, and the pesticides that we bring on the canola ends up in the grounds killing bees, doing all sorts of things that we don't want it to do. So here's a challenge for us as uh, MIT Nano to say, how can we sense where the action is in the ground directly at the roots of every individual plant and in real time tell the tractor, this plant today needs no fertilizer or this plant needs a lot and we can preempt these things. This is the kind of thinking that we need where we come together to address these, these challenges that we see. Let me bring one more example in the context of agriculture, because agriculture is not only about plants, it's also about animals. So this lady here um, is giving about 1,000 liters milk a year. And typically what you find in dairy is general practice, the cows go and eat. Okay. Best practice, if you go to the big dairy farms in Wisconsin and California, they have a little tag in their ear. And uh, when they go to the food dispenser, there's a group of high performance and a group of low performers. And depending on the performance, the animal gets more or less food. That's state of the art today. But we know, despite the fact that genetic diversity of milk cows is relatively narrow, there are huge differences in the individual needs of the animals based on their status in the ovulation cycle, based on their age, based on the microbiome that every individual cow has. So what if we have nanosensors inside of the animal that tells by the time the animal goes to the feeder the exact requirements not only for the base feed, but also for the specific amino acids, for the uh, amino stimulants, for medicine even, that every individual animal needs. Now, at DSM, we know a thing about uh, this kind of thing because um, we found, interesting enough, you are looking here at a climate killer. We're looking at a climate killer because cows emit methane. In fact, three cows together emit about as much methane as the car that you use to drive here together. And there is a project that we have in DSM where we reduce, that's a feed additive that, um, that cows um, can eat and significantly reduce the methane. But while doing the research for that, we also found that the methane emission of a cow correlates with its specific energy status. So if you have a nanosensor that can measure at an individual cow what the methane emission is, it gives you very interesting information about 
the microflora in the rumen and how to intervene and how to feed the animal. Again, fantastic opportunities ahead, which are becoming a reality and opportunities for us as the community of MIT Nano to think ahead, what can agri precision agriculture do more to be to more precise and less wasteful? Now, I mentioned DSM a couple of times. You probably must be thinking, who the hell are these people? I never heard of DSM. I promise you, you're not alone. Most people haven't heard um, who we are, so let me just say a little bit of who we are. DSM, uh, I think, Vladimir, you mentioned this, stands for the Dutch State Mines. Now, that was 1902 when DSM was founded as the Dutch State Mines. Today, we're not really Dutch anymore because we are 80% of our people. Sales and profits are outside the Netherlands. We're certainly not a state-owned company anymore because we're publicly traded today. And we're not a mining company because we've reinvented ourselves along the way a couple of times. From mining, we went to uh, basic materials. From basic materials, we went to high-performance materials. From high-performance materials, we went to nutrition. Today, we are the world's largest producer of vitamins. And I bet you, before you came here this morning, you touched DSM materials more than 10 times, including this thing is full of our polyamides and high-performance materials in your car, the vitamin that you took this morning. All of these are products that what we don't brand, but the original materials are coming from DSM. Now, today, we'd like to think DSM stands for doing something meaningful. And we're deeply, deeply caring about these um, sustainability goals, and it's not us alone. Uh, we're too small for the Fortune 500. Um, we're not actually even showing up in the Fortune 500 with our 10 billion sales. But we are number two in Fortune 500 companies that change the world. Ahead of another small company that had a little bit of an impact on the world that you may know called Apple. So we're a little proud of that because we're really driven by these projects and by being active the active force of doing good in a world where we don't want to rely on other people to do things. We want to be the guiding principle. You've seen us in the uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index um, leading for the last 15 years or so. And um, maybe a little bit more about R&D. We have um, about 20% of our sales are generated by innovative products that were launched in the last five years. We are, oops, pretty passionate about this, about 5% of our sales um, are reinvested in R&D, and collaboration is absolutely critical for us. In fact, the world is changing very fast, and we know if we don't learn and change at least as fast as the world is changing, we'll get left behind. And we can only do this together with um, institutions like the MIT, we're very passionate about doing that together. And we're like challenging ourselves for big, hairy goals as the ones that I laid at a few of those. We also like to challenge others. Um, this, for example, is a gentleman who won our Bright Science Challenge last year. We sent out a challenge to the world and said, send us ideas and projects in the space of uh, sustainable energy and solar energy that make a difference to the world. And this gentleman is actually a professor from Argentina who had a method to mine lithium in much more eco-friendly ways. I don't know if you know, of course, there's huge demands for lithium for the batteries of this world. And lithium mining is a real nasty process with a lot of nasty chemicals. This gentleman figured a way to do this in much more gentle ways. And we felt this was a project that we want to get involved in and support him and help him. So we challenge ourselves. We challenge others to do that. And um, with that, I think uh, I'm coming to the end. D Damien said something the other day. He said, you know, we've got um, a great thing going here at MIT. Um, the um, academia typically envisions the world, and then industry makes it a reality. And you know, we can live with this distribution of tasks. But if we collaborate, and if we do it in different ways, and we come together exchanging these ideas in a much more intensive way, ultimately, the impact that we have together 
is much higher, and that's really, I think, what it should be all about. So let me close by saying at DSM, our goal is to create bright science for brighter living today and for the generations to come. I think with the MIT Nano, we have an incredible institute today that will help coming generations not only to enjoy the benefits of nanotechnology, but also create this future today. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'd be delighted to answer those. Otherwise, uh, we can also meet afterwards. Just come and say hello. I think I know the answer, but I'm very curious about the, the, the young woman you have on the screen that produces, three of them produce uh, equivalent to the, the, our car. Um, so I missed exactly the mechanism that you were explaining how you're reducing the methane. Um, if you could explain that just a little bit more. Sure. So you've got the microfrolar in the, in the uh, rumen of the cows. And of course, the digestive system of the cow is a ruminant, is very different and distinctly different from um, monogastric animals. And what you have there is a symbiotic relationship of many, many different uh, bacteria. One specific type is the archaea, which is the bottom of the energy chain. And they are living in symbiosis with all the other bacteria. And they actually, as side product, have produced methane, which is actually mostly a channel for hydrogen that is generated by other bacteria and it needs to go somewhere. So if you understand this well enough and you block the archaea, in uh, allowing the synthesis of the methane. You have an impact on this entire chain of the symbiosis of the different bacteria. And also you have another side effect there because the energy now needs to go somewhere and chances are it probably stays in the cow. So there's two effects if you intervene that way. First of all, you have a, a climate positive effect, but also um, you can expect that the cow will overall grow differently because you mess with the energy um, uh, balance in the animal. And that's very specific again to ruminants. It's not really cows, it's all ruminants. So is there an opportunity to close the loop around the cow? So if you were monitoring, if you had a methane sensor for the cow, you know, would you do something to modulate what the, the feed were to, you know, if you had active feed, active real-time measurement of, of the methane from the cow? So there's people that, yes, that's the, I think for that we don't know enough yet. But there's people that claim that you can manage methane uh, by offering a certain diet. Now, you have to be very careful because these things are very complex and everything's connected with everything. So if you offer a certain diet, you may reduce uh, the, the methane emission, but that may have another effect, uh, another angle. The one thing that we find, and I say this if we add um, our feed additive, it actually has a um, sustainable effect um, in the reduction of methane. But there's certainly, if you understand these things well enough, and again, that's where sensing plays a key role, the ways to intervene in more precise and smart ways, I think, are, are humongous. Other questions? Yes, please. Anna. Lovely talk. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that you'd like to partner with MIT as a researcher at MIT, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about your vision on how that will happen. So the actual way in which DSM and MIT can partner together to change the world for the better. So I think there's multiple ways uh, that this can happen. We're particularly excited about, as I said, the, the atmosphere um, in MIT. And there are so many different ways that we can go that I, we had a discussion yesterday, we had a discussion yesterday evening but precisely this point, it is in fact a little bit the Pollo and Primavera problem because we could go everywhere and we need to make up where we want to go. Just to illustrate this with an example, one member of our scientific advisory board, an institution that we take very seriously, is actually sitting right there, it's Chris Foyt in the um, Institute of um, Synthetic Biology, who is helping 
with our biotechnology division. Um, we are working with uh, Greg Rutledge on, the, on, on fibers and thinking of ways how can we do it there. So in the material space as well as in the, in the nano world, I think there's multiple ways and we're pretty agnostic about exactly how we do this as long as both sides' interests uh, are met. Let me ask a question. Um, as the cities are growing, there'll be a need for maybe twice as much population, uh, city uh, blocks, right, uh, than we have right now to, to uh, accommodate influx of people into the cities. Um, that clearly generates a variety of new sources of pollution and indeed new challenges in managing all the waste. Is DSM providing some direction of what could be solutions in? Is it a, you know, abating smog or thinking about uh, the effect of such overpopulation of very dense areas on the local areas that might be still needed for agriculture? So we are looking at this stage business group by business group. What are solutions that we can contribute with our component space, with our 2,000 scientists to make a contribution to that? In our materials division, for example, we're looking at ways that's maybe going that direction of how to rethink the car. Today, we've got multiple, num multiple um, polymers in one car, which makes the recycling basically a no-go. But if we want to really th think in circularity, we have to rethink the car and basically work together with the OEMs and uh, the brand owners to say, let's reimagine this and either go back to steel, which nobody wants because it's heavy, or we go to a car that is based on one polymer that makes the recycling much easier. But these are things that we can't do alone. We'll have to um, build, <coughs> build alliances and look into um, broader uh, players along the chain. And that includes smart cities as well. So there's obviously solar energy. There's in our biotechnology group quite a few people that think of um, what can white biotech gen uh, help to um, produce substances or um, aromas, flavors, sweeteners um, that are more sustainable and that can contribute to this vision? Okay. Um, I think on that note, uh, let's thank Marcus one more time. Thank you. Thank you.